Hello and welcome to Reef Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we're talking about Affair in Trinidad today. This is a, a film noir from 1952 and it shares similarities, shall we say, with Gilda. That's a rip-off of Gilda. <laughs> and a little bit notorious as well, yes. which it rips off to some degree. Uh, it stars, starred in Gilda, Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford. And this was Rita Hayworth's comeback film after four years away from Hollywood. So maybe you can explain... What was happening, or do you know the history? Yeah, uh, she'd been divorced from Orson Welles. Uh, she started this affair with Prince Ali Khan, which candlelized everybody. This was more or less around the same time as Rossellini and Bergman. Uh, moved to the south of France. He was a real playboy and uh, mm -hmm. so on. But then she divorced and uh, returned to Hollywood. And this was... The film that she made after, I think, The Loves of Carmen, The Many Loves of Carmen or something like that. I think that. so, yeah. And she starred in that with Glenn Ford as well, didn't That's she? That's right. I mean, Columbia didn't have very many stars, mm. you know, and she was by far the biggest one. I'm a bit annoyed that this is in this box set, and I think it's basically used to sell the box set. What's the box set? Yeah, the box set is uh, Columbia Noir 2, uh, and it's got Rita Hayworth, yeah, on the cover, mm -hmm. yeah. And it kind of annoys me because this is by no stretch of the imagination a B-film, you know, by any definition that I understand. I mean, a B-film is normally kind of a low-budget film, you know, done by a studio to be released at the bottom half of a double bill. You know, this is an expensive, A-budget film with the two biggest stars at Columbia at the moment and it was an enormous success in the year of its release so how it becomes a B film mm. is only really to sell this box set what are the rest of the films in there and you know are they would it not sell without them is that the implication well I mean I think the you know the other films are are lesser known I mean they are Framed Ocean Drive The Mob uh, there is Tight Spot which is a little bit like this, but, you know, but not. So it has Ginger Rogers and Edward G. Robinson, you know, but I've never heard of it. Uh, and it was really Ginger Rogers sliding out of stardom. I think it's one of the, the last films she made. So this is by no means comparable. And I think it's a bit of a cheat to put it in this box set. Yeah, so this film cost $1.2 million. The budget ballooned because there were problems with the script. There wasn't really much of a script. And Vincent Sherman said he felt kind of conned into the film, having been shown like a four-page treatment and then discovering after signing on there was nothing else. Uh, Rita Hayworth complained about there being no script and mm. wouldn't come back until there was one. Uh, the screenwriter, uh, Virginia Van Upp, um, who wrote Gilda, uh, had personal problems and sort of couldn't finish her own script. Mm. I understand. This is all from TCM. Um, so on TCM's website, they've got a couple of articles. There's like notes and an article by uh, a chap called Rob Nixon that talk about this, talk about the, the kind of history that went into this film that it also included Columbia having to pay Reza Hayworth $3,500 a week for nothing and, unless they made a film with her, mm. which is, you know, it's what they did and they just kind of cobbled this one together, it sort of seems. It feels um, cobbled together. But it made $7 million. <laughs> so, you know, audiences weren't turned off. Well, no, it was one of the big hits of the year. $7 million in 1952 was a big gross, mm. you know. I mean, obviously exceeded by things like Cecil B. DeMille films or whatever, but... Any film that grossed over $4 million was considered like a blockbuster. Yeah. yeah. And this was $7 million domestic as well. I That's don't right. know about international or anything. Yeah, so, so it was a big success. So the so, film is about a guy who's died in Trinidad, which we're helpfully informed at the start of the film, is a British colony, and it's being opened to the, the wider world by the British being there. You know, So your kind of Western imperialist uh, viewpoint is established very early on. <laughs> um, it's true. And... Uh, <laughs> This guy dies, and it's ruled a suicide initially. His wife is Rita Hayworth, who's a nightclub dancer, as you mm. might expect. Mm. Um, there's his friend, Max Fabian, who is a shifty fella from the moment you see him. He has feelings for Rita Hayworth. At the same time, Glenn Ford, who is the dead guy's brother, shows up. He's been sent a letter days before saying, come to Trinidad, I've got a job for you, it's going to be great. Mm. He shows up, he's shocked to find that um, his brother's died, he suspects foul play. It quickly becomes apparent that the brother was murdered. 
didn't commit suicide. And this notorious element to the plot, I guess, is the use of Rita Hayworth to get close mm. to what I say his name was Max. Yes. Um, because he suspected of murdering him or being responsible for his mm. murder. So she gets close to him for the sake of the police. Mm. She's also developing feelings for the brother and he's very pissed off that he that she seems to be going with him. Yes. So there's there's a love triangle thing going on. And Glenn Ford does not look very good in this film. He's he's kind of filled out, so he's got like chipman cheeks. And uh, you know, he's not photographed very well either because from some angles his ears really look like, you know, Vlad the Impaler's ears, like huge and pointy. <laughs> well I kind of didn't I didn't believe the chemistry between them. I think that's a central problem in the film. And we were, we're agreed that the film is not very good because it's, it's, what, 100 minutes long, 98 minutes long. And after an hour and 10, I just said to you, what do you think of it so far? And you went, oh, I don't think it's very good at all. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we're in agreement that whatever it's setting out to do, it's not really doing. I think there are three reasons to watch this film. Okay. Uh, the first is Rita Hayworth. Right, like, you know, she is fantastic. That opening number is fantastic. I don't think so. I love it. Uh, I disagree. I, d- I don't like her dancing at all. I thought it was clumpy. Oh, no, and, I think and she's brilliant. Ungainly. I I no, I didn't like it. I could see what it was kind of going for, especially that she's barefoot, and that kind of adds a certain something. She's got such control, you know, because she does minimum gestures, and she holds the screen. She's not flaying all over the place. You know, uh, and I think particularly in, in close-up, she's fantastic. Uh, and I think you might argue with the choreography. I mean, it is kind of, you know, choreography of a particular moment, really. I didn't like that she was barefoot, but, you know, that's probably like the Trinidad uh, <laughs> component of the choreography, I suppose. Yeah, it's what uh, America imagines Trinidad to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and um, who is the choreographer? It's, Bet- it's Bettina something or other. Valerie Bettis. That's right. So, you you know, you might disagree with uh, the choreography. The song is very derivative. You know, the Chica Chica Boom Girl uh, is what Carmen Miranda had, had been. And also, she, you know, that there's a Chica Chica song with a Carmen Miranda imitator in Phantom Lady. So, you know, it's a bit cheap to give that to, like, a star like Hayworth. But I think she herself is fantastic, and she moves beautifully. And actually, I was very appreciative of just even the hand gestures. They're so precise, right? And it is like a choreography of even the hands. Yeah, like kind of you can tell where her fingertips are has been decided in advance. I loved it. I I disagree with all of that, apart from the song being derivative, which was. (laughs) um, It looked like, I mean, I I honestly felt like it felt like a person who had never danced before. Oh, my God. Are you crazy? Yes. Yes, you are. I'm angry. <laughs> I'm angry You're about nuts. it. I, no, I don't, I, I don't think it's it's no it's no core de force of dancing. It's I, I, like I said, I thought it was ungainly and and clumpy. I I think it's wonderful. So we'll just have to agree to disagree. I mean, yeah, you know, the second she, one I thought was better, was, and the second song I thought was better in particular. I mean, she was a dancer, and not only a dancer, but who had been performing with her father, you know, since like uh, I mean, she'd been trained practically from the age of three or four, and she'd been performing with her father, I think as early as 12 or 13 or something, right? So, I mean, she'd been a dancer all her life, right? Uh, She stands up to a stare. Uh, I prefer her to Kelly. Uh, You know, so she, yeah. I'm not saying she she hadn't danced before. I'm saying it looked like she hadn't danced before. Yeah, well, I just think you're wrong and you don't know how to appreciate it. (laughs) Didn't think it was very good. Um... Like I said, as, as, for, as for the chemistry they, they, they don't share, I think part of it is Glenn Ford. I mean, on, on one hand, there's something I like about Glenn Ford's performance in that he's incredibly pissed off that his brother's dead and apparently been murdered and no one seems to be making fuss. He's kind of appropriately pissed off for that. But then there is this thing about him developing this relationship or these feelings for uh, Hayward's character. And there's this kind of three days they spend touring the island and falling for each other. And you're like, this, this is... Yeah it lurches from kind of one side to the other. And when he's in his angry mode, I think, how can anyone possibly like this man? It's a stupidly written character, but I think you're wrong about the chemistry. So I think they do have chemistry. And, you know, clearly, they exhibited uh, in Gilda uh, 
Yes, yeah. so again, I'm not saying they haven't had chemistry before. I'm no, saying no. they don't have it here. Well, I think one has to distinguish between chemistry, which is, you know, how two actors interact, and then, like, a poorly written film with poorly defined roles. Mm. I mean, you know, which is what you have here. I mean, the declaration of love came so abruptly, and it was such a cliché, and mm. it's so poorly directed, right? I mean, I think Vincent Sherman, he was he's lucky that he got to direct what he did because... You know, there are some scenes here as amateurish as anything I've seen. I mean, you said this is like a, you know, a five to five on a Friday shot, right? Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and there are so many little situations like that. It's really derivative, mm-hmm. you know, and unimaginative. Uh, and it's a shame because, you know, I think Hayworth is fantastic. I think the wardrobe is fantastic. And I think uh, George Walker's cinematography is fantastic. All right. So those are the three elements that... I would, you know, want to see the film for. What, why the cinematography? What stood out to you? There are just shots. So, for example, you know, the shots in the port, right? Mm-hmm. Which are wide shots. Well, I, I mean, I was just looking at how the lighting was, like, so pres- so complex, yeah? Like, you know, there's li- various light sources. They're all interacting to create a mood, mm-hmm. right? As well as to light a port in the dark yeah, in mm-hmm. Trinidad, right? So... Um, I do think that one of one of the best things about the film is the mood it creates throughout so it may be incoherent the plot and everything and the characters may not make much sense at times but there is a mood that i appreciate there is and i think it comes through glenn ford anger and it comes through the settings and lightings and the evenings and the isolation of characters to you know take like uh, max taking her out to talk to her and leaving her isolated and then there are these these things that that they they generate this kind of espionage dark mood I think most of it's created by the lighting so there are those wonderful shots where she's been you know trying to find these papers and then she's got to hide as people come into the room and you see her in close up with you know the the people behind the screen right and she's lit in darkness and there you know the light falls on them Mm. right and the contrast between the two it's just it's just beautiful I think yeah and it does definitely create a mood the but, staging as well then contributes to that, you know, which I noticed one or two points. It's just it, it's not necessarily kind of groundbreaking stuff, but just the way the characters are placed in frame, one character looking at others in the background, or the way that there's a symmetry created by the way characters stand around Rita Hayworth in the middle, for instance. Yes, I mean I would credit that to the cinematographer because, my God, Vincent Sherman is like. <laughs> well, you've you've had a go at him once before on the podcast for. Have I? Well, well, you mentioned that um, he wasn't above. As you put it, sleeping with the actresses. Oh, yes, yes, because I, I read his biography and, you know, it was kind of almost embarrassing. Like, you know, I, I like that kind of gossip. <laughs> but I think in that book, it was almost kind of embarrassing, really. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, he mentioned all of them. Betty Davis and Joan Crawford are the ones I remember, mm. you know. Um but it was almost like, uh, you know, he really hated to do it. And, you know, he was just for saving the film. And you think, oh, you know, why mention it at all then? It, it just felt like kind of Humble creepy. bragging. Yeah. It felt like Look who bragging. I had to sleep with. And actually, you think, well, you know, I mean, probably the only reason why you've had a career is because of that. Because, you know, I mean, in this film, some of the scenes are just horrible. <laughs> right? Like, uh, and there's that scene with the blonde woman kind of going in the corridor you know, and she looks back and like everything is, you know, you could predict every cliche appears in that shot. It does. I didn't mind that though, because I liked her. I uh, thought, you know, she, she, uh, I think she's the um, choreographer. I think that's the character she plays. Is it? Yes. Um, well, she's the only other notable woman in the film, for one thing. I think it's a different person. I don't think so. I think... Uh, well, I've also got the review... Oh, no, you're right. It is, yeah. Yeah, I've also got the review of the film in uh, the New York Times from 1952. Here, which which mentions her, right? And the the, the review from nine fifty two by uh, Bosley Crowther is not complimentary. All right, <laughs> uh, about anything, not just not her. Um, hardly mentions it. Um, it just says she plays the Hachel Vixen. Right. Uh, um, but no, it's not impressed with the with the film. I don't think it was impressed with the dancing either. Uh, hold on. <laughs> There's some good lines in it, but. More than the stories being tedious and lackadaisically played by a cast which Vincent Sherman has directed as though he were lolling in bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not complimentary towards Hayworth. 
The demurely returning Miss Hayworth proves no bargain after an absence of four years. In that time, we had probably forgotten what a mediocre actress she is, and now the bold fact, politely winked at in the past, hits one right between the eyes. Well, he's nuts. I mean, she's wonderful. Uh, and the dancing she does in this picture, he says, makes her look both vulgar and grotesque. Well... So Bosley is not in the tit column for the dancing. Well, I mean, he's an idiot. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it is... It is vulgar. I mean, well, vulgar. It's very sexual. There's no question about that. It's all about sex. Mm. But I think it's also kind of modern and interesting, really. And I think she does it beautifully. So um, I love watching her. Fair enough. I like looking at her, but yes. you know, that's not the same. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I love watching her in motion. I think she's somebody, you know, who moves incredibly well, incredibly beautiful. She's a joy to see just kind of moving, really. Mm. And just to quickly return to, to Sherman and uh, sleeping with uh, his actresses. Um, this is, again, from the information on TCM. Sherman noted, so I'm guessing this is a, his autobiography, that he was awarded a 2% interest in the film and a $10,000 bonus by Cohn for his contributions to the script and for, and this is a quote, providing a supportive atmosphere for Hayworth. What do you think that was, Jose? Well, it could be anything. <laughs> yeah, it could. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to lie, uh, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, kind of, you know, not very gentlemanly of him, really. <laughs> uh, so I, I found this an incredibly disappointing film because I love B-films. Yeah. yeah, I kind of... Yes, I do. I love, um, you know... I, I often find that these low-budget gangster films or, you know, films dealing with the nether regions of... Well, the nether regions... The nether regions, but also like the nether <laughs> world, you know, of people's minds and, you know, the forbidden and repressed mm. things. You know, they bring out such interesting things and often because of low budgets and very innovative ways. This is almost like the opposite of that. This is an expensive film with big stars, you know, that's just hackneyed because, you know, it, it went in without a script and the script was never fleshed out. And, you know, mm. the story is, you know, very derivative and the director doesn't know how to make the most of the cast. And I think, you know, that is very evident in the supporting cast, right? If you think of the supporting cast uh, and how they performed in Gilda mm. and here, they're like miles apart, right? Mm. Uh, and, and, and here it's, um, what's his name? The, the cafe owner who played Uncle Pio in Gilda. You know, in Gilda, he's so charming and smooth. Here he's meant to be the same character, but, you know, it's just awful really it's um Stephen Gray yes who was Uncle Pio in Gilda and who here plays Vital the the nightclub owner I mean and in fact the character is the same as Uncle Pio yeah mm -hmm. you know the way of talking the jokes yeah he's really meant to evoke that happy memory of seeing him in Gilda <laughs> yeah. you know but he's just very poorly directed I think mm. um it was funny what you're saying though about the um uh, the dark recesses or however you yeah. put it um, because it did occur to me during the film that one of the other things that I liked about the mood was the sense because this is all rich people effectively or at least well Max is rich and he has this huge mansion and he spends quite a bit of time there and he's got his uh, what appear to be you know ex-Nazi friends yeah. working on a backyard science project like the boys <laughs> from Brazil um, what it, I don't think you have <laughs> explained what it is but it's like they 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 can use the Americans' weapons to bomb America, and it's like, yes. oh, we're evil. Yes. Um, but I did like the idea that, like, that it's a community. Trinidad is like where all these rich white people go to spend their money and retreat, and like everyone there seems to have something to hide if yes. you move there. You know, there's a general feeling to that which I kind of like. Yes, I suppose um, so. Which you get from uh, Max's character certainly, and also he does have something quite serious to hide. Yes, but for example, I mean, we never figure out the husband and the husband's involvement do we no it's, it's <laughs> completely left hanging so this thing that he was murdered for his involvement in this plot somehow and you and there is this other character who's murdered and he's clearly like when, when you meet him he's nervous and of all of the you know the, the rest of these uh <laughs> i'm gonna just call them ex-nazis they're all confident and hello and they're drunk yes. and whatever but he's nervous and so and so when he gets killed you tie the two together right mm. like he was having second thoughts about something rather clearly the husband must have been but you're not actually told what he you... did if he went to the police or no. anything like that he's just dead left yeah. and the other thing that's left hanging or one of the probably many other things i haven't given thought to the rest but um 
she's taken upstairs by Olaf, this kind of nine foot gorilla <laughs> of a man at the end. And then the shootout happens and the bad guy dies and he runs upstairs. And then it just cuts or fades to a boat where they're going to America and they're going to start their life, uh, uh, Ford and Hayworth. And I said, what happened to Olaf? He's got to get past the gorilla first. (laughs) (laughs) He just runs into a room and gets her. It's not logical. I mean, the, the, I suppose the only other thing I really want to mention is Juanita Moore. At the beginning of the film, you ask, what kind of name is that? (laughs) And then, of course, it took me a while to register that she is the mother in Imitation of Life. Right. Right. I mean, I didn't recognize her because in Imitation of Life, she's so much fatter, you know, <laughs> than she is here. Um, here, she's really beautiful, but the character yeah. is kind of so racist, really. You know, so she's like a kind of a mammy maid figure, but, you know, who's got the wisdom of Africa carrying <laughs> onto yeah. the Caribbean, right? She, you know, she, she's like she, an oracle. She's constantly <laughs> dispensing these, these, these West Indian... Uh, um, Proverbs. In yes. fact, Rita Hayward says at one point, is that a West Indian proverb? And yes. she says, it's West Indian wisdom or West Indian house knowledge or something like that. I can't remember what she says. But like, she's just constantly, she's got the gift. And actually, the other thing is, they say she has she has a mental acuity. She knows, she has mental radar. That's what yes. they say. She knows what you're going to do before you do it. And she gets your bags unpacked, whatever it might be. It's so stupid. And I, yeah, dead racist the moment you see her. Yes. And every moment after that. So, but, but I would like to point out, I didn't say, what sort of name is that? I said, that's an interesting name. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's be precise about these important matters. So, it's a film with ultimately little to recommend it. There's historical interest. As I there think any film be. with Rita Hayworth has something to recommend it. Yes. But little else. Little else, yes. Yeah. Uh, the costumes are wonderful. And it was Academy Award nominated. For the and, and, I, and I said to you, I bet you can get what that's for. And you went, cinematography? No. Costumes? Yes. Well, yeah, <laughs> there you go. I had to be one or the other. It's the only... Yeah. Because <laughs> I knew Rita Hayworth wouldn't be. So <laughs> 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 and those are the only three things to like in that movie. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm glad I saw it. It's been uh, taunting me, you know, in this Columbia box set because I'm a real fan of Rita Hayworth. I just love watching her. But really, the, the box set is a con. I want to say it again. The box set is a con, right? Because the film doesn't belong here. It's, you have to give the name of the box set if you want to yeah, really boycott Columbia it. Yeah, Columbia Noir 2, you know, kind of... Uh, well, I suppose it is a noir. I oh, it's a noir, that's for sure. Yeah. There's no getting around that. So, I mean, so, it, it technically fulfills the requirement so of being a Colombian noir. I, yeah, I take it back. It is a noir. But if your expectation is of a B-movie... Well, almost all the others are. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's not a very good movie, but it's not a B-movie. That's right. But that's just me making it up, actually, because... So I take it back. No, it's advertised, <laughs> it's advertised as Colombia noir, not Colombia B. So that's just me projecting. You can keep all of this on, by the way. I don't mind being a fool. <laughs> <laughs> that was Garment Jungle was on Columbia Noir One, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, the box doesn't say anything about B films. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> I was getting a tizzy over my own projection. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. There. It also doesn't say it's not called Columbia Very Very Good Noir Number yeah. Two. <laughs> 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 so you know actually I've liked almost all the be- I liked The Garment Jungle and uh, I'm going to see the rest so I would only recommend if you're a fan of Rita Hayworth of which there are many 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 <laughs> <laughs> would she be your poster in prison when you're trying to cover up digging your way out of it I don't I don't think my poster would be a woman though you know, there's a wonderful book, The Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yeah. I forget who the author is now. I, I read that book as a teenager. And I've seen the play. And it's also been a musical. And it's about, you know, this homosexual guy and a communist or a left-wing agitator sharing a prison cell together, right? And he entertains. So the, the gay guy bonds with the straight guy and they become friends over him alleviating the boredom by making up these stories mm. that come from films that he's seen. Mm. Yeah. And kind of, you know, and so they involve like, you know, the big film stars of the era, but of which Rita Hayworth has a special place because, you know, Rita Hayworth was of Spanish descent. Right. Mm. So 
I think people all over Latin America and Spain so on kind of claim her, you know. She's she like, was born in Mexico, right? No, no, no. She was born in the U.S. Oh, she was. Yeah. But her father was Spanish. Uh, and I think maybe her mother was Spanish as well. Uh, so uh, anyway, Latin people mm. claim her. And she's got a special role in the culture. Actually, it's so interesting because I bought this book about uh, a censorship during the Franco era. And it has a poster of a fair in Trinidad. <laughs> and of course, the poster was censored. Yeah. yeah. And then they changed her decollete so you wouldn't see so much of her breasts. Mm. You know, but finally, before it was approved, they painted on a dress that had short sleeves <laughs> and no neck. I'll, I'll send you those pictures. Uh, it's really, you know, quite incredible. So, so kind of, you know, this film also in Spain has a, a kind of a reputation of being one of the most heavily censored uh, visually. You right. Know, kind of in terms of the poster art. I think... Um... I think the reason that I assumed she, or thought she was born in Mexico is because she she did kind of famously whiten herself, if that's a fair kind of word to use for Hollywood, or had to. I mean, I don't think, I don't know that it was like she. Um, I think whiten is the wrong word, mm. uh, you know, because I mean she was white. They did electrolysis to raise her hairline, right? And they dyed her hair red, right? Yeah. But those processes of transformation were very typical of sure. any star. I mean, you don't think it is particularly to speak to. I don't think it was. I don't think it was to make her uh, less Latin. Though right. I, I mean, it could be. But uh, I mean, I, I'm not well versed in it. I just, I just that's something I'd heard. I guess. No, I um, mean, let me see. She was born in 1918, um, and where was she born? She was born in Brooklyn. Right. Um, it doesn't say who her mother was. It normally says in early life. She yeah. was born Margarita Carmen Cancino. Her father was Eduardo Cancino from Castilla de la Cuesta, near Seville. Yes. Her mother, Volga Hayworth, was an American of English and Irish descent. There you go. Mm -hmm. This is a photograph of her in 1935. Yeah. She looks different. Yes. Though, you know... Yes, yeah, she does look different if you see her in her early films. So I've been reading... or. Really rereading the Star Machine uh, by Janine uh, Bassinger, and she talks about you know the process of stardom and of manufacturing stardom and the extent to which people could manufacture stardom or groom people for stardom, right? But that this process of you know trying out new hairdos, new hair coloring, yeah, kind of you know was all part of the process of you know try throwing stuff so that it something might stick, right? right. So they did it with different people. But also, if you see films like A Star is Born, that process of transformation was, you know, a, mm. a kind of a typical process. So I don't think it would have been any different for her, you know, than uh, uh, for other people. And she was someone who was more often in the films tied to the Irish, you know, part of her background, yeah, than to the Latin part of her background. Though, paradoxically, you know, she also did a lot of films that were about... They were either set in the Caribbean or in Latin or in Argentina or, yeah, she did The Loves of Carmen, right? So there was something also that was, I mean, you know, it wasn't hidden that her father was Spanish, mm. uh, you know, so, but I think both parts of her background were kind of brought to bear on her persona. Yeah, this is just general from Wikipedia, as it always is with me. Um, it's a, in her early career, it talks about... Um, during her time at Fox, Hayworth was billed as Rita Cancino and appeared in unremarkable roles, often cast as the exotic foreigner. And then you get to Harry Cohn. Uh, Harry Cohn argued that her image was too Mediterranean. I mean, this is the word of sure. someone who's not very nice, but, um, which limited her to being cast in, quote, exotic roles that were fewer in number. He was heard to say her last name sounded too Spanish. Uh, Judson, her then husband, acted on Cohn's advice. Rita Cancino became Rita Hayworth when she adopted her mother's maiden name to the consternation of her father. With a name that emphasised her British American ancestry, people were more likely to regard her as a classic, quote, American. Well, and then it goes into the dying of her hair and the uh, Sure, process. well, that's true, you know, and it yeah. definitely worked. Uh, Which I think that's the kind of... I think it's because I knew that her uh, birth name was not Rita Hayworth, and then I just extrapolated from there that well, she was Mexican and she completely she changed her skin colour. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> not quite as severe as I had um, assumed, but uh, or thought I knew. But yes. there you go. All right, any last word on the film? 
look, I, I can't I can't pillory you too much for making me watch it. It was fine. I said, find a film that's 90 minutes long. And you went, 98 minutes, and this is my choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I it, gave you three other choices. Yeah, you did. Um, and I was happy with this one. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I kind of... Like, I didn't hate it, right? I enjoyed it. It's just completely unremarkable throughout. Yes, it is. Um... I mean, I was disappointed, to be honest, because I yeah. thought it would be better than it was. Yeah. Uh, and really, the only thing that I find remarkable is uh, Rita and her two dance numbers. Which you love. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for listening. We're eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the website is eavesdropgetthemovies.com. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.